Hi, ladies. Welcome back to the podcast. Today is going to be just pure service trade industry gold because we've already had a hell of a conversation and we hadn't even pushed record yet. I had to stop so we could do that. I'm like everybody needs to hear this. So you will want to stick to the very end of this one. We're going to have so many great conversations. My guest today is Samantha Houchin and she is from Denver, Colorado. And her and her husband own a company, an HVAC company, um, just to be specific, that is called The Weather Changers. Cool name, too. I'd love to hear how you came up with that. But we're going to talk about all the real shit that happens. Your work with your spouse. How is that? You know, I think a lot of women work with their spouses in this industry. We're going to dive into some of that stuff because sometimes you feel isolated and alone. Some of the things that you feel when you're at work and then you come home and you're like, I really want to tell him this, but... <laughs> You know, you can't. So that's what this podcast is for. We're also going to talk about how incredible Samantha has been able to help her husband grow this business and how she kind of stepped out from being behind the scenes and just has evolved into a partner that walks alongside him and is now a face of the business as well, which I know a lot of women in this industry, they are the head honchos running that business behind the scenes and keeping all the shit together. And a lot of them never get to have their spotlight time. And that is what this podcast is about because it's time to pull the ladies out of the office and start showing what it is that they're capable of and how big of badasses they really are. So Samantha, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of your backstory and how you got into this industry and a little bit about you. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, I'm Samantha and, uh, I, my, his, my, I guess my backs, like my background is, is more, been in like accounting and like marketing. Um, I kind of started in the construction industry, it like working for like a major home builder. And then I went to go work for like a small um, framing and foundation company where I, I really learned the most about like running, actually running a business and being a part of those conversations where I was able to you kind of soak in like, oh, this is, you know, this is, oh, this is what p &L is and this is this and oh, this is the decisions that a business owner has to make. So um, my my background is definitely in like the operational piece of it. Um, I am also a mom of three. I love musicals, like ridiculously amount of musicals. I'm a pop culture like whiz. I'm constantly like quoting movies and TV shows. So um, I also am horrible at like, I, I love a cheesy like saying, but I am, I get it wrong about 99% of the time. So like the two and the bird and like one in a bush, like I'm always saying like, oh, it's just like this. And then I'm it, it constantly saying them wrong. So it's become like a little funny thing with the people that know me. They know what I'm trying to say. They just understand that I'm never going to say it correctly ever. <laughs> so, um, and then, yeah, my husband and I own the weather changers and uh, we've been doing that for the last 14 years. That's incredible. So when you started this business, like how did that happen? Did you guys just get together and be like, should you start an HVAC business? Or was your husband working in this before? Or like, how did you guys get the business started? So yeah, so he he was working for a local company and then I was working, I was a, a manager of an like a, a accounting, like accounts payable department. Um, and it was always kind of his vision to, you know, start a company. Um, you, you know, he like worked started in California where he was like an attic rat is what he always used to say. And he would be like, I see how much the jobs are. I see how much the equipment is. And then so like, obviously being able to do the math to be like, wow, this is how much the company is bringing. Um, and so it was really his like kind of vision at first. And then he was like, what do you think about starting a company? I was like, let's go. Like, let's, let's do this. I think this would be so much fun. Uh, we get to be our own thing. I, you know, we had just, we'd started the company right after we had my, my son who is now 14. Um, he was three months old and we decided to like, let's do it. Let's start a company out of nowhere. Um, so <laughs> it was definitely stressful, but at the same time, it was like, it, it allowed us to be able to be at home with, with, with him and like kind of raise him. And then we had our daughter and again, it, it, it gave us level of independence where we weren't somebody else's boss. We were our own boss. We got to kind of walk our own, you know, path. And, um, you know, that was really what drew, drew me to it originally. And again, working for that framing and foundation company that was a small, like a small operation, um, it was like, I want that. Like, I loved that. That was probably 
outside of my own company, that was the the best place I, I worked. Um, and I loved the dynamic and just like the culture. And it was just like, I thought it was like a magic, like just like a magic bubble. And we were never going to, it was never going to happen again. And so I've now created the business, you know, to be very similar to that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cool where you can take your past and kind of like put it into your present to create something that is, is meant so much to you and, and, and keep kind of the legacy of it going. That's beautiful. What an example for your kids too. I think a lot of times when people start businesses, they're like, well, when my kid gets older or especially for women, they're like, I'll just put it on. Like, like you hear women say, I'll just put that on the back burner for right now. And then, and I'm like, back burner, there should be no back burner. Like there's, you can do a little bit of things and a little bit and build and do things at obviously your own speed. But I think it's so incredible to watch women in this industry that are moms and like major, major kudos. Cause I, I'm a mom too. I did it as a single mom. Like I realize how freaking hard that is. My kids were raised differently than a lot of kids are. And I didn't really realize that until like my husband and I got together and he came with three kiddos and I had two kiddos. Like my kids just came to work with me. They were like raised in the office and they were, they saw things. And now at this age, like my son wants to start a freeze dried candy business. And my daughter is 14 and already has her own little sugar scrub business. And it's so cool to see how they watch you with things. Have you been able to see that with your kids? Have they kind of carried on an entrepreneurial spirit or do they talk about those things? Yeah. So our, our oldest son actually works for us. He's a service tech. He started at the, you know, he, he was around, uh, I think it was around 21 where he was, or 20, where he was just kind of like kept talking about like, you know, I think I want to be a part of the company because he watched us build it from the ground up. And he was, you know, at first was always like, no, that's just not for me. Like he'd help, he, you know, he'd help my husband on like a weekend or something. And he would be like, that's just, it's just, that's not, that's not something I want to do. And so then when he started to get out on his own and he was like, oh, actually, I think I could do it. So yeah, we brought him in and he started as like, an install grunt, like just kind of a helper and then learn, started to learn maintenance. And then now is, you know, our, one of our top service techs, um, sells like the membership plans, like nobody's business to our customers and really is an advocate for, you know, both sides, the field and the office. Um, my, my 14 year old, uh, he, again, he was the, you know, the baby when we first started it. And even when he was a kid, we worked from our home for a lot of years, he'd hear the phone ring and he would know like, Oh, it's time to be quiet. It's just so funny. And yep. he, you know, be like, phone's ringing, be quiet. And he would be like, okay. And he'd sit there and he'd play with me in the office and hang out with me and help me put paperwork together. And so he'll, in summer when he's off school, he'll, he'll come here too. And he's created some like funny memes for our social media. Um, and then my daughter who is eight, she thinks she owns this business. Honestly, she's like, this is mine. I'm going to take it over one day. She comes in, she makes herself at, 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 at home. She's like writing stuff on the board. Like she's running meetings. It is, it's such, it's, it's so fun to have it be like a really a family owned business, but then also to see like hopefully future generations like that was always my, like my husband, like Chris and, and our goal was to make like to build a sustainable business that is hopefully like generational. So to watch them have interest in a company that we have built is is really one of the goals that we had for it was for the future. So the fact that our three kids really kind of open to it. And then my daughter-in-law works in our office as well. So she's like our, our dispatcher and scheduler. And, and so she didn't know anything about the HVAC industry. And we just brought her in and have trained, like showed her and like, she's phenomenal. And she's the voice that customers hear. So it's, it's just really cool to have like the family unit so tight in the company. And then again, to watch the future generations of like, they may be the ones that take it over when we're ready to, to pass the torch. And uh, it, it's, it's very prideful. Like the, the pride is overwhelming. I love to hear you say that because I think a lot of when people start businesses, they don't really realize what taking that leap of faith to start a business actually can do for a family tree. If yeah. you think about it that way, like many times we jump out and we try to do things and we're like, 
guess I'll figure out how to build a plane on the way down. You know, like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Nobody really does when they jump in, you know, like you see somebody, some other company making this money and you're like, great, we can make good money. And then you get into business and you're like, oh shit, I see what they spent all this money on. You know, like you really learn things, but that it's something that your kids are now seeing that their kids will see that it wasn't weird to start a business. Like, why wouldn't I start a business? I like, it's a piece of cake to start a business. I watched my mom do it. I watched my grandma do it. And it's such a cool thing because that ripple effect that I talk about all the time on here, I'm so passionate about that because how can we tell them to chase their dreams if we're not doing it ourselves? Because they look at us. They don't listen to us. We know that. They watch us. And it's so cool, the example that you're setting for them and even for their friends too. I'm sure you could probably see as like their friends would come around and they kind of see what you guys do. It's kind of like a little bit weird if their parents don't own a business, like are your parents working all the time? But you have that flex, that flex and freedom of your time that is just so cool that you're showing them that they can design a life around a really profitable and meaningful business, even though it's in the trades. Yeah, which is something that I love that you talk about too, is that you're not just in HVAC. You're not just an HVAC owner. You're not just answering the phones. You're not just anything. Give us the backstory on how you kind of came to realize that. Yeah. It, so when we, when we first started, it, it, I, I kind of put myself in the background a little bit, you know, it's a HVAC, HVAC especially is a male dominated industry. And I kind of let my husband be the face of our company. Um, it just, it seemed like customers were, there was a lot of like little mini moments where it was like, I'd be talking to a customer on the phone and they're like, well, I'll just wait for the technician. And it's like, okay, so I'll just be the girl who answers the phone or I'll just be behind the scenes. Um, and in 2019, I attended the Bryant Women in HVAC conference. And that was the first time that I was surrounded by women in the trade. Like even if you go to our supply houses, you didn't see women at the counter. You didn't see women even standing in line to purchase parts. You, I, every woman that I dealt with was in a supportive role. So they were like the accountants or they were, you know, answering the phones. It wasn't like powerhouse women who were running the business. And so I went to this conference, walk in, and there was like 200 amazing females there. And it was like, oh, wow, like, this isn't just a male dominated industry. Like there is a lot of women in this industry. And it was so eye opening to me. And I came back and was like, I am tired of just just being behind the scenes or just being the girl who answers the phone. And so I took a huge step forward and and my husband and I then started to run the business side by side. And I became the partner that he really needed. He didn't need me behind the scenes. He needed me to be right next to him. And he and I, since that moment, have really just worked the company like like hand in hand and like side by side. There's we're we have, we're never, oh, you're the face, you're above this. I'm just gonna be in the background. Um, and it has changed our company, our culture, everything for the better, because we are such a united front. Um, and it was something that we needed to do to kind of move our, our company in the next, in the next step. Yeah. How do you think your company benefited by you step stepping up and doing that? Um, it, I think internally, it definitely showed that like, we are, again, we are the, the united front, but then it also, I stopped putting myself in a box of like, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just this. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna answer the phones. I'm just gonna do this. I'll leave, I'll leave the big decisions to Chris and, you know, I'll throw some ideas out there. Well, now, no, I'm throwing ideas out like crazy. We're getting together. We're trying to find how the operation side and the field side can kind of come together to make processes and improvements and how do we better our customers? How do we service our customers better? What, 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 you know, what membership plans do we offer? What, uh, what are we looking for? What are our goals? What is our mission statement of this company? Um, and really all of that kind of came heavily into focus once I came to that, con when, after we came home for that conference, I came home with a notebook full of ideas of just, even for Bryant, it is very obviously brand specific, but we were a Bryant factory authorized dealer. We didn't even really understood what that really meant until I went to that conference. And we realized, 
oh, here's rebates we could offer. Here's better financing. Here's all these programs that help us educate our customers and educate ourselves on these equipment. And so we were, again, came back with just notebooks full. I was so fired up from that first conference that it even fired up my husband to be like, let's go. Because we we felt very not complacent, but we just kind of were content. Like we were just kind of like in this groove of we were working, you know, we were, you know, obviously working hard. We were still small, but, you know, we, we weren't struggling like we were in the first couple of years. We were, we were doing okay. It was kind of becoming just like a lifestyle of like, okay, well, we can pay our bills. We, we, we can pay our employees. We, you know, we're doing good, but we both wanted to move the company to the next step. And we, didn't know how to do that. And again, coming back from that conference, it was like, we already had the foundation of the company, like a puzzle, right? We had the border already put together. We were trying to find the middle pieces to make the picture so much more clear. And we started to get those, those pieces started to come in place after that first conference. And then I've been attending that conference every year since. And it, it still every year is a game changer for, for me personally. And then also professionally for our company, because you just learn so much from the the people that are there, the the speakers, the hosts, the trade shows that they have. And then I started attending other industry type conferences. So I was like, if I get this out of the Bryant women in HVAC, what about the women in HVAC are? And I went to the ARH, AHR Expo and you, you just start to surround your people, yourself with people in the industry and, and, and like-minded people. And it, it just has really helped us grow professionally and, and personally as well, um, to yeah. who we are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really a testament to if you, if you can, if you can put yourself out there a little bit, um, you, it's really, it's really rewarding to see what you can come back with. Yes. That's one of the toughest things is I think a lot of women come into this industry like you did. I came into the septic industry the same way with my first company. Like my husband at the time was like, let's start this business. I was like, what? You know, like I, I know how to market stuff. That was my background too. But it's like, now I got to learn how to read the financial reports. I need to learn QuickBooks. I need to learn like literally everything that the, it takes to run a business. And many times women come into this and they're like, I have nobody to help me. So these conferences are so important. But how many times I remember going to like even smaller networking events and being too damn scared to get out of the car. I don't know anybody here. Uh, like, what am I going to do? I'm just going to stay in the corner because I can, I'm like big and bold and stuff when I get to know people or, you know, on my own comfortable platform of stuff. But when I'm in a group of people, I'm that person that's like, I need to observe for a minute. I got to sit oh, back, which was me too. Yeah. So, so uncomfortable. Once I start talking, I'm always fine. I can get in and I can talk to anybody, but it's that first initial, like, who am I going to talk to thing? Um, I'm much better when people approach me, which a lot of people, you know, like we talk to each other just great. Like a lot of people wouldn't know that about us, but I find it so interesting because the more I get into personal development, there's so many people that like are speakers for a living that are exactly the same way. But you have to put yourself in that uncomfortable situation, get out of your sweats and going home and hanging out with the dogs or the kids or whatever, the hubs and go out to these events. You find the most incredible people. I just did that at a marketing event this week. And it was so cool. I had no idea what I was going to. A friend of mine, Alicia, invited me to go to this. And I was like, I just want to go hang out with her. So I was like, yeah, sure. Um, I'll go to this. Then I get there and I saw these two girls that I watched my daughter watch on TikTok all the time. And I was like, and I sent her a picture. I'm like, do you, do you know these girls? And she's like, God, mom. Like she's losing her mind because for kids, teenagers, the TikToker influencers are like bigger than our movie stars were to them, you know? Yeah. And she's like, oh, picture, you gotta get a picture. They were so sweet. I went and talked to them afterwards. It was like a room of 30 people and they made a video for her and was like, hey, Aisley, and like sent her this oh, video. Oh, so awesome. Like, Mom of the week win right the there. year. You, just... you, yeah, you've, you've, you've made the call on a win for the rest of the year. You got it. Like, 
I learned so much stuff even in the marketing meeting, but to be able to go and make a connection for like her there, like, I didn't know I was going to run into these girls. I have no idea. And I'd watch these videos with her and just being able to talk to them. I was like, thank you so much for making great content, like being a great role model for the girls. And they like literally started getting teary eyed. And I was like, that tells you right there that they care, like that they're yeah. good people, which is just so much, you know, just so cool to see that. So sometimes you show up to these events expecting to like try to get business out of it. And you have put so much pressure on yourself to tell them what you do as a living, tell them what you do with this, like go in and ask somebody in the room, like, tell me about yourself, not your business, but tell me about yourself. Like I do at the beginning of this podcast, I always have to preface it to people because many times people just kind of, I get the deer in the headlights look of like, you don't want me to talk about my business? Like as entrepreneurs, we default to that and we really have to start tapping into that. What can I contribute and how can I be part of a community where I can give back based upon what my experiences are? Good, bad, ugly, all the shit. We have to be honest about what is going on. That's where the connection is so cool and it's so real. And I think it's so good for this podcast that you're willing to be vulnerable and be able to tell us some of those things. So what are some of the things that maybe you wish that people would talk more about that's in the trades industries? I know before we hit record, we were like, would you please just be honest about how your business is going? Like for me, I'm like, it's freaking slow right now. And I don't yeah. know what the hell is going on. And like, we need to talk about this instead of like everybody I ask in this industry, I'm like, how you doing? And they're like, oh my God, I'm so busy. I got this. And you're like, yeah, okay. Uh, so what's wrong with me? And that's what we keep doing to ourselves. So give me some, give me some examples of that. Well, that is definitely, I mean, the, the contractors or like other company owners, um, it's like you have, you have to fluff, which I just don't feel that that is, is genuine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we just had a, a dealer meeting at the end of February and Colorado, like our, especially Denver, our weather has been very weird this winter. It has been beautiful, more beautiful days than cold days. So for any heating and air conditioning company, if you're not struggling, like what are you doing? Because it doesn't, there's just not, it doesn't make sense. Most customers are not even turning their furnaces on. So, you know, we were asking other companies there like, oh, hey, how, how's it going? How's business? Just, just, and they're like, oh, we're, we, we're scheduled three months out. And it's just like, Okay. Uh, sure you are. Like, I, and I'm sure yeah. maybe there are companies that are, maybe they, they waited to do all of their membership cleanings until now. And that's, that's great. And I'm that that's perfect. But it's like, it just, to me, is it realistic? Like if you ask me how I'm doing, I'll be like, yeah, our installs are great. We're very consistent with that service is we're ebbs and flowing right now with depending on how the weather is. If it's, if it's hot, if it's warm outside, our phone is not ringing. If it is cooler, we're getting phone calls or we, we've, our bids have gotten kind of gone through the roof a little bit because of how cold it is. But like, I don't, I don't think that there is, you're not winning any prize by lying about wh where you are in, 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 as a company. So if you ask me, how much did you make last year? I'll be honest. I'll tell exactly how, how I make, I'll tell you exactly what our goal is this year. Um, because I just feel that there's a lot of knowledge out there that's not being shared because people are either it's their company is not doing great. And instead of asking for help or, you know, trying to figure out why it's not working, they want to kind of puff up their chest and be like, oh, we're the best ever. And I just will never subscribe to that because I just don't think that that's helpful. And I would rather if a comp another company comes to me and is like, hey, we're dead. We're, it's really slow. We're not sure what's going on. You know, I'll be like, Hey, you know, we are too in some areas. Others were not. Have you looked at, do you guys have a membership plan? How, how are you guys marketing? What is your, what is your social media looking like? You know, I, I'm, I'm always willing to help other companies because there's enough business for every, everybody to get something right. There's there, we can all get a piece of the pie and I would rather take business from a giant, like, we have a huge HVAC company out here that is historically known for ripping off customers. So if we can take oh, yeah. customers from them, then the customer is going to be in great hands with a, a smaller company. They're not going to be taken advantage of. And then we both win. And there's a lot of wins that a lot of companies can do. But for whatever reason, people don't want to be real with their numbers or they, you know, it's a, there was one company that is smaller than us. 
And they're like, I was like, oh, yeah, what was your sales last year? And they were like, we heard 14 million. And it was like, that's not even possible. You, But OK. And so it just it, to me, it's instantly like, OK, well, I, there's there's no real conversation that's going to happen from this point on because you're not going to be you know, authentic with with what you're saying. So I just will kind of be like, oh, that's great. Congratulations. And then just kind of move on to somebody else who who would be would be willing to have a kind of a, a real and vulnerable. It's vulnerable to talk about, you know, where, where sure. you are and and how much money your company makes. And um, but I'm I feel like we don't grow if we don't share real information. Absolutely. Absolutely. It would drive me nuts. My ex-husband would be like, somebody would call for a bid on like a big project or something. And he'd be like, yeah, well, you know, we've got five trucks. And I'm like, we do. At that point, we had like one or two. Now it's like, why do you tell? I would always, it drove me crazy. I was like, why do you tell people that? And he's like, well, someday we will. I'm like, yeah, but we don't now. He's like, well, but I can hire other people to come do it. And I was like, but it wasn't even about like even just a job situation it was like as he would talk about the business and it drove me crazy I'm like please be honest about stuff I love that you're willing to do that and you're willing to say Look, this is the dollar amount that we're at right now you know like we did super good during COVID and we like doubled year after year after year with business stuff. And then like, we've been hitting 1.3, 1.5, 1.3, 1.5, like just hitting your head against the ceiling. You're like, okay, what do we need to do different? And that's where you have to seek help. What got you here won't get you there. And we really have to examine that and be like, okay, shit, we've hit the same ceiling for the last two to three years. What do we need to do to really bust through to the other side? We had to look at different kinds of hiring, different kinds of people, higher level people, quit hiring all these entry level people to come in here because you're going to get entry level results. Who knows more shit than I know about this business to take it to the next level? And I think that's where the problem lies is that people don't want to admit that they don't know how to get to 5 million to 10 million. And so, and they're scared to hire those people. I remember telling my business coach, I'm like, what the hell do I even ask them? Because <laughs> like, I have a vision. She's like, somebody that's really good should be able to take that vision and turn it into a reality. Yeah. And her telling me that was like, oh, hell, okay. And then we started hiring people that can help us do more things. We've resulted in bigger ticket jobs. We've really started focusing more on the sales aspect of it and not just doing a good service, but selling shit while we're out there, especially if you're slower. And that's something we got to look at this year because I think everybody's going to have kind of that weird election volatile year. We've been in this industry long enough. We see how this kind of works its way out. So you're yeah. not alone if you're experiencing things like this. It's not normally our slower season right now and you've had weird weather and there's just weird shit happening in the world. We have to lean on each other. That's what Ladies Kicking Ass is all about. Is like, let's lean on each other and be like, hey, even though you and I are in different industries, I sell septic pumping, you sell HVAC services. It's a service-based business. What I'm doing may be able to help you, even though I'm a septic company. What you're doing may be able to help me. And we have to work together on those things and stop thinking, like you said before we hit record, there's a secret sauce to something that, you know, you got that magic little thing. I know the marketers will try to sell you like crazy <laughs> shit about, I'll make you number one. I'll do this for, you know, $2,500 a month. You're like, I can do this shit for free if you will sit down and learn how to do it. So yeah. like- how do you, in your business, when you're in a weird year like this, what kind of conversations do you and your husband have about like how to maintain, sustain, and maybe try new things in order to get business coming in the doors? Yeah, I mean, that that we really kind of started uh, even a couple years ago. Um, again, when I came back from from the Women in HVAC conference, it was just it was four of us. So it was me in the field in the office only, and then it was my husband, and then we had two installers. So it was like how and I well, I guess my my son was working for us too at the time. So it was like I I came back notebooks full of ideas of all these things I wanted to implement, and oh let's do this and let's do that and let's do this, and it's like. I don't have the time. I'm only one person. Plus I have to try to answer the phones and run the business and do all this. So it was like a lot of that stuff kind of got put on like a little bit of a back burner just because I didn't have, I didn't have support. Um, and then mm -hmm. that really 
opened my eyes of like, okay, the next person we have to hire needs to be somebody in the office. I need help. I can't answer every phone call. I can't do all the accounting. I can't do all the marketing. I I need help. And it was it was a big it was big for me to even admit that because I think especially as women, we take on so much, right? We're the mom, we're this, we're that. Like, nope, I've got it. I'm going to come home from my my super busy day and I'm going to cook all the food and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it's like, there's no shame in, in acknowledging like I need help. I can't do everything. I'm only one person. So we branched out and we hired our director of operations and marketing. And he has been, he has also been a game changer for, for, for our company, because I was able to finally open this note, these notebooks that I've had of all these ideas, and we are starting to implement them. And it's like, okay, we got on, you know, we were pretty archaic and we had like paper invoices. Nope. We jumped on and we, we started, we, we digitized everything. We had, you know, our techs have apps in the field to be more, to, to be more responsive and, and we can collect payment. And so that's taking smaller things off the plate. We, I hired my, my now daughter-in-law, um, to answer the phones because even with help from David, my, my director of operations, it, we also couldn't both ends be answering the phones and doing all these other things that we had to do. So we branched out even more and, and got, you know, hired in Paige who now answers all the phones and, and, and owns that position. And now we're able to go, okay, like this last year, it's, it's our winter has been slow. So let's let's go to the, let's go to the, let's go to the table. Let's, let's go to the board. And we start writing ideas. What can we do? Have we, you know, what about this avenue for marketing? Have we tried next door? Have we tried, like, what about Yelp? We have, you know, good, we have good, um, we we do good with Yelp. Maybe we should add up, up the budget a little bit more and see how it does. But we're constantly looking at things through different lenses to be like, Mm-hmm. How does this work? How did this work for us in the past? Maybe we we stopped something in the past that we like look at again. We're just we're never stuck anymore. And I feel like that it's such, such, such a cool thing that that we do um, it, on an operational side is we just we never stay stuck. If we something's not working, we'll cut it and we'll change, try something new. We're constantly trying to find other ways to bring in business if, if it is a slow time you know is it is it something that we need to look at like an e-commerce thing or or you know how do we bump up me- memberships more so we can you know have that that help to help us during our busy or our slow season and have our techs be you know kind of busy we also take this time to do training the, during the summer yeah. there's no way we could train our staff like our our teams for stuff well we take the slow times and we bring them all in we did a we did a um like a low like a low voltage kind of wiring where we had an old furnace and our techs were like ripping it apart and like doing stuff like hands on training and you have to take advantage of the of the the lulls in the system in the schedule because you know once it starts to get warm it is going to get busier and we're not going to be able to focus so much on the team and like hey how are how are you guys doing do you have any questions we'll go through we started doing like case studies like medical like doctors will do they'll take a case and then they'll kind of they'll just like dissect it to like what happened what could we have done better how can we change our processes so that's something that we've really started to try to implement too to make everybody better in 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 the field in the office like did we have a customer where we just kind of dropped the ball how do we fix that so it never happens again and i think that yeah. it's because we are always looking at ways to improve especially the customer experience we we're just never satisfied. We want to always have it be better. And that has been huge for us. Huge. And when you are so concerned about that, that you're doing hands-on training, you're taking the slow time, you're not cutting them and sending them home and saying, tough guys, we don't have enough work coming in here. You've run a business properly enough to account for maybe some of those slow times that come through that you can afford to do some training with them. I love the case studies. I wrote that down. I was like, that just needs to be like SOPs that you're putting together of like, okay, this job, 
we dropped the ball here. How do we fix this? This is a particular job. Like I opened up the tank lid and the ship broke in half because it's corroded and it, it needed something else. Like, what do we tell the customer in this situation? Like you can take so many jobs, like just having somebody, that was good for me. Having somebody just sit in the office and analyze these jobs and write SOPs for particular things that happen in the field will put together a amazing field operations manual just based yeah. upon the jobs that they're doing every single day. And you can hire somebody to do that for pretty inexpensive once you teach them your industry. So that's a great, yeah. thank you for that. That's a yeah, really great right. tip. <laughs> you're right. I think yeah. that there's a book. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. It's called who not how. And I think it's incredible. If you haven't read it, it's so good, but it's one of it. those books that talks about how entrepreneurs get into this cycle of like, um, well, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. Especially when you're going to the next echelon of your business and you're like, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to set up a service plan. I don't know how to set up a membership. Like, what should I do with these things? But we don't seek it out. We just stay, we feel like we're stuck because you're yeah. only stuck if you're unable and unwilling to pivot a little bit. And the whole book is the premise of, you need to find the who because the how will come after that. So many people get stuck in like how to do it, how to do it, how to do it, instead of who can I hire that can help me do this. And you yeah. get to a point of your business, which we've all been there. I remember running that office all by myself, installs, pumping, permits, accounting, marketing. I did all the shit with little kids. And I look at my business now and I'm like, obviously we are doing more volume now, but I'm like, how did I ever do that? And if I was still stuck in that mindset of I, no one can do this as good as I can, I have to do it myself. I can't ask for help. It's a sign of weakness. Busy is a badge of honor. I'm just going to keep doing this. My business would not be anything that it is today. That first hire is a bitch because it's a hard one. And it's like the first time you hire a babysitter for your baby and you're like, <laughs> oh God, yes. don't, don't, don't touch your face. Don't do this. Don't do that. By baby four, you're like picking up the pacifier and wiping it on your pants and putting it back in their mouth. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, can you keep this kid alive for three hours so I cannot go crazy? And it's yeah. one of those things that you really have to evolve with your business in that same way. Like if you can hire somebody that can do this at 80% of what you feel like you were doing, I think we think we're a lot better at our jobs and sometimes we are. And you don't realize that till you hire somebody that's totally dedicated to one part of your business. And then you're like, yeah. huh, that's the way that's supposed to work. It's yeah. very humbling. Well, that's it's how, very that, very that's how that's supposed to. Okay, okay, I agree. Cool, cool, you cool, have cool, to be yeah. willing to do it. It's a big leap of faith. It really is because it is. it is that baby. It is. When you build a business, that is part of your heart and soul and ideas that you've put into the universe and you've watched it all come together. And you're like, yes, you don't want anybody to fuck it up. You don't. And it's so yeah. scary to turn it over to somebody, but you have to have trust because there's so many people for good at people that want to be of the ownership of this business involves them in the decisions that you're making. Like that people are there. Yeah. I, I think hiring, especially hiring the, the first person, like you said, it's not only like, are they going to be good? But then it's also like, you're taking such a huge risk and like a kind of a, a you're investing in your company like it is a very scary thing to kind of hire that, especially the first big hire. Like when we hired our director of operations, like when we brought David on, it was like the conversation that Chris and I were having was like, okay, you know, to Chris, I was like, I need help. I can't do this. I need somebody that can especially focus on the marketing side of it because I, I only know enough and I, I know enough to kind of be dangerous, but I don't know are, is our marketing company even working? Are they doing what they're saying they're going to be doing? I don't know how to do Google ads. like, And I don't have the time to learn it. So let's bring somebody in that knows this, who can help us. And, and that first hire, especially for us, it was a big deal. It was a lot of money. We knew we had to we had to bring somebody in that had the expertise that could kind of take all of that off my plate, but then also help grow that 
And it's not a service tech. It's not an installer. It's not something we can send out to the field and we can bring money in to cover his salary. It was coming out of the operations piece side of it. So it's like, we really had to like, it was like, okay, this is how much it's going to cost us to get somebody in here to help us. But we're not going to, we're not going to see the results instantly as we would if we had a service tech who we could put in a van Mm -hmm. and go fill this calendar and bring us money. It was an investment into our future. And it was, it, it was, it was hard to wrap our brain around it, but we've never looked back after we did it. You know, you have to sometimes be uncomfortable and and put yourself in uncomfortable situations and know like this isn't gonna we're not gonna see results in a minute. It's gonna take a couple, but literally from when we first hired him to even very quickly after that, it was it was an instant of like this was the right thing to do. I can't believe we waited this long. Um, and it, it, it really helped strengthen the team and the company. And sometimes you have to, you have to be a little afraid of your goals. And I I think there is a saying that's like, if a dream doesn't scare you or a goal doesn't scare you, then it's not good enough. Or it's not, I don't know. Again, I suck at sayings. I just know like the, the meaning, the meaning behind it. But they have to, you would have to be a little scary or, or, or what's the point? It's not, it's not big enough if it doesn't scare you a little bit. So um, investing in your company in, in the, the people that you have working for you is, is huge. And not enough people talk about that either. Yes. That fear that you're feeling is preparation for a shit ton of growth. Yeah. Because if you are comfortable in places, you're not learning shit because you already know how to do it. That's what makes it comfortable. There is so many opportunities to get your technicians and your office staff. I think that's something in the trades that we don't talk about enough either. Like we train the technicians and we send them to trainings and we do this and they get certifications and they do all this stuff. Everybody in my office, in my septic company, it goes through the septic certification to do like home inspection for the septic systems because it's like an ADQ septic inspector certification. Everybody does that because you can do them online. I don't need Mm -hmm. to pay for the certification for my office staff. They're never going out to do those, but you need to know what they're looking for when they're out there because my office staff does put those reports together. So when you understand what the process is and taking the office staff out, into the field. When I hire new office staff, we have field trips all the time. We set in a new tank. We're going out there to watch how it's done. We're drilling a seepage pit. We're going out to see how it's done. I need you to see the physical product that is out here so that when you're explaining it to people on the phone, you get it. Many things that like your industry as well, you're looking at this like, you know, just on a piece of paper, how you wire the shit together. And then you go out and you're like, Ah, so many people, especially in the trades, even the women that are in the office, they're very hands-on, like, let me drive situation. I'm not going to learn how to drive by watching you drive this car. Like you sit next to me and correct me when you need me to, but let me drive and sending them to training where they can learn the stuff, not just you as the owner going and coming back and trying to regurgitate everything. Set aside a little budget so that you can do that. Have a training program. We work with a company called Blue Collar Success Group. They're phenomenal. And they're in the trades industries. They do HVAC. So I'll make an intro for you to them because they're killer. Yeah, that'd be awesome. have so much training, so much sales training for the technicians, for management, sales team, office champions is what they call it for the office people, dispatchers. They have so much training around that and they're actually trades people. They own trades businesses. So they understand that. Last year we did Tony Robbins business results training, which was a lot of mindset work around it, which was also absolutely incredible. But for tactical on hands-on stuff, they do mindset training and actually like, let's figure out the margins in your business. Let's figure out how to set up a sales process so that everyone's doing it consistently all the time. Yeah. When you invest in things like that, which it's not a lot, it's like maybe a thousand dollars a month. And you think about how much that's one good sale. You teach one person, that's one good sale. And then it just carries on and carries on and carries on. When Since we've started implementing outside training, 
the whole team has been lifted up. I look at it as an owner, like I look at it with my kids or your husband. How many times do you say, blah, 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 and you teach them something or you tell them how to do something and then they come home from work, your husband or from school with your kids and they're like, hey, mom, guess what I learned today? And they'll say the exact same thing that you already told them. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I know. I already told you that. But they're not listening to us for the coaching aspect of things that they can get from outside. I think in the trades, people don't invest in that enough and it really makes a huge difference. How many good reviews you get how high the ticket sales are. Everything is elevated when you really put that training time in. So I love that you do that with your team. It's really important. We tell people when we hire them, we invest as you as people. We want you as people to do well. We make yeah. everybody fill out goals. Like what's your personal goals you're working on? I had a guy that came in and he was like, I just got to pay off my debt. You know, that's that was his big goal to just pay off his debt. And then the next he paid off his debt one year because we I stay on him like crazy. We have this goal board. I'm looking at it with him all the time. And that's then cool. he paid off all of his debt. And then he was like, I think I'm gonna buy a house. And I'm like, you should buy a house. And we hooked him up with some people that we knew and he bought a house. And I, I remember that. standing and looking at the goal board and being like, Well, I just paid off all my debt and now I'm just gonna go buy a house and get into debt again. And I was like, Ooh, light bulb moment. I'm like, no, you're investing in yourself and investing in your future. You live in Arizona. Yeah. That shit ain't going down anytime soon, man. That's not, don't look at that as debt. That is an investment, man. And he's yeah. like, ah, oh. and then he bought the house and he's like in his young twenties. And it's so cool to see when you care about them, which many service techs coming in or people that come to work in your company, they need somebody to believe in that. You mm -hmm. believe in the people that work for you, they will work their tails off for that business. And it just helps everybody. I agree. I love, I, like we do, every employee that comes in, um, we do a defense, developmental plan. Like we, okay, where do you want to be? Where do you want to see yourself in a year and two years and five years? Where do you want to see yourself in the industry? And we really try to focus on on helping people kind of move like again, moving their bar, like, like kind of moving their bar forward. Um, you know, we had a installer that we hired last year, you know, he was like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older in terms of like installing, like my, like I'm on the, uh, like, it's not something I can do forever. Installing is very hard on your body. And, and so his, he really wanted to learn the most about the HVAC industry, but also really wanted to start learning service. So when we, you know, when it got a little bit slower after summer, we started teaching them how to do maintenance calls because maintenance to, to transition from installing to mate to service maintenance is like the best way to do it. You have to be in the furnace, in the AC, cleaning it, understanding how the whole, like the whole cycle works. Um, mm -hmm. So we transitioned him to start, you know, training to start doing a maintenance tech. And he handled a ton of our membership cleanings because they're easier They're Obviously we've touched them a bunch of times. We already have the dis established relationship with the customer. So it's, e it's an easy transition. And, you know, he's picked up and is able to now actually run a service call if, if, if we needed to. So it's, it's making sure that our, our, our techs also don't pigeonhole themselves or even, you know, you page in the office. Like I didn't know anything about HVAC when we started this company. I knew yeah. the operations. I knew how to, I knew how to do QuickBooks. I knew how to set up stuff. I knew how to get insurance. I knew how to do that piece of it from my past, but I didn't know HVAC. I just started asking questions. Every time my husband would have a service call, I would be like, okay, what happened? What, why did it do this? Why did it do that? He literally physically took us down to my, our furnace and took the door off and is like, this is an inducer motor. This is the pressure switch. This is how it goes. And I just was like, I'm like a sponge. And I soaked it all up because if I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm answering the phone, talking to a customer, how am I supposed to help them? So sometimes, you know, especially if we're busy and we're, you know, we have two weeks before we could get a customer on a service, a service call, we'll ask questions like, hey, what's going on with your system? Oh, have you checked your filter lately? You know, try this, this, and this. We'll put you on the calendar. In the meantime, try these things and see if this helps, especially in the summertime. And we'll have customers that call back and are like, oh my God, you fixed it. Over the phone, you fixed it. Thank you so much. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. Call us and let us know if you need anything. And they'll call us back because they remember that. So it's something that I've, I've also really helped with our our office staff to to know like 
hey, you're answering the phones. This is how this works. This is how, so we don't, we don't stop. We don't only focus on tech training. We focus on the company training. And even if you don't mm -hmm. understand it, like I, I, I had Paige do, do they, she always does a ton of like tech training classes because the more you can understand like what people are talking about, the more you can, again, it's the customer experience, the more you can help a customer. Um, and it, it helps her grow to, so that she understands if somebody's calling about this, this, or this, like, oh, well, have you checked your filter? You know, have you checked this? It sounds like you don't have power. Have you checked your breakers? Um, and and it, it's just, it, it gives you more confidence to even talking to customers because you are not just the girl answering the phone. You are trying to be the, you're the, the especially the in Paige's role, she's the first person that customer gets to experience is, is, is her on the phone. And if you don't know what you're talking about, or you, you, you know, sound like you have no idea what's going on with it, you know, that's, that's what you show the customer. So, you know, we really yeah. try to focus again, this customer experience for us is, is huge because especially for a service industry, like customers are, are it. We don't, we don't install equipment and we don't service equipment without our customers. And if we are not being out there in front of our customers being helpful, then it's just like, what are you doing? You're not, you're not going to get, you're not going to be in business for long if you can't figure out how to treat customers. Absolutely. You have to love your industry. You have to know things. Your confidence on the phone is what gets them to continue talking to you. So I love that you train that you train the people in your office to be able to answer those questions and troubleshoot with them. We have the same kind of situation where it's like, hey, you know, you're backing up into your house. Do you have sewer line cleanouts? Like you can pop those open. At least it's coming out outside and it's not up in your house. So yeah, you know, being able to troubleshoot with people is so important um, to, to help them out. Even if it's not a sale right away, who the hell do you think they're going to call back next time? Even when well, you refer somebody. Yeah. Well, customers also just sometimes they they'll call and it's like they are frustrated, right? Their AC, especially if it's if it's a summertime, it's hot. Their AC is not working. They just want somebody to kind of show them some empathy and listen to them and understand that they are frustrated. And so, you know, that's what we really, you know, focus on a lot as well is like it's. It's showing the customer empathy and understanding, like, if you ask a customer, you know, oh, have you checked your filter? If a customer is like, I don't know what that is. I didn't use to, again, not knowing anything about heating and air before I started a heating and air company. I just, it was the box, you know, that little box on the wall. I just turn it up and down and I get hot air or cold air. I didn't know there was a filter. I didn't even know what a furnace looked like, you know, and so I can... I can go into every customer interaction with a ton of empathy because most customers have no idea about their heating and air conditioning system. It's just in the basement or it's in a crawl space. It's it's out of sight, out of mind, unless it doesn't work. So I, I again, talking to customers or co other companies, they're like, oh, these customers are just like, they don't even know, don't know how to check their filter. It's like, well, has anyone ever told them, hey, this is how you check your filter. This is where your filter's located. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's taking just an extra step to help the customer figure something out on their own um, that I feel gets lost because if you're not helping the customer in their house and you're not collecting a service call and you're not this, I think you can be impactful even over the phone because that you're going to resonate with the customer and they're going to call you back because look, I, they didn't just try to force somebody out there to sell me something. Yep. They actually helped me over the phone and they walked me yep. through where to even find my filter or, you know, they, they weren't pretentious when I was like, I don't know where a filter is. Like they, they showed me empathy. Um, and so it's just, again, the, for us in the customer experience process, we, we can really kind of all commiserate with customers in that aspect, especially everybody here in the office that answers the phones, because we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know anything about heating and air until we started working in it. Um, so I just sure. feel like you can give customers a lot of grace and understanding that, if something isn't working or they're frustrated at how much something is going to cost, try to put yourself in their shoes. And it makes sense to you because you're in the industry, but try to put your, try to find a, an example of where 
you you had to get a repair or something and and you you weren't you didn't know what was going on and it was costly and you know answer the questions as though you would want to to be to be answered so i it's there's nothing wrong with showing empathy to customers it's one of the most important things you can get them to do to buy from you in the first place or to come back i love that yeah. message so yeah. so so important so with all of, I want, I don't want to take it lightly that you won that award. Is that your banner in the back here? If you're watching this on yeah. YouTube, you can see her banner in the back. And I love that you did that because yes. we need to talk about, we've talked about the how and how we got people and who the people are and how we did this. And sometimes you just have a really bang up year and you're like, we crushed it this year and you want to shoot it from the rooftops. I remember making my first hundred thousand dollar month more than I remember making the seven figure year. Like when you hit that seven figure thing, because it was like, so in my mind, it was like, we're never going to do this. Like when we first started, we'd have like a $10,000 month. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like we're killing it. So to be able to put another zero at the end of that, I was like, oh my gosh. And I really didn't even think about that for a long time. And a business coach of mine at the time, Jeff was like, Remember when you hit that six figure month and how excited you were? Like I called him. I was so excited. I took a picture of my QuickBooks and sent it to him. I was so proud of that. And I didn't tell anybody else that. Like, why? Why didn't we do that? And I think many times we were talking about this before we hit record. As women, we're like, well, we don't, we don't want to be braggy and Maybe people won't get it or people are going to think I'm conceited or, you know, like they're going to be like, mm, must be nice, which is like my most hated thing ever. When people <laughs> say that I'm like, it is nice. It yeah. is nice. Yeah. Try it. Um, but how do you and how have you celebrate that award that you guys won? So yeah, so we won in May. We we were uh, we were awarded the Bryant Dealer of the Year um, for 2023, and it we 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 went in to that to the like the dealer rally that they do it with, and we knew we were nominated because it, it's you have to you have to win like Circle of Champions, and then if you are the most, if your score is the most, then you win a Medal of Excellence. So we knew we won Medal of Excellence, and then if you're a Medal of Excellence winner, you get your name in the hat to be nominated for Dealer of the Year. So to us, it was like, oh, this is, this is a huge get. This is, I don't, I don't know if it's possible, but it was like, let's nominate anytime we could be invited to the dance, right? Anytime we could be, our story could be told, we could be put in front of Bryant people who they, you know, Bryant as, as a corporation, they didn't know who we were. We're a small dealer in Colorado. They, they don't, they didn't know us from anything. So it was like, anytime you can be in front of the people who read your story, who see your stuff like that, it, you always want to, again, be invited to the dance, right? So mm -hmm. we went to the dealer rally. All of a sudden, it like they're on the screen and they're talking about like, this company does this, this company does that. And like, I'm sitting at the table and I'm like, this sounds like us. Like, these are our numbers. This sounds like, oh my gosh, it sounds like us. And my 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 territory manager, Jermaine, who's like, she's like our, our partner in crime in this, you know, I'm sitting there like flicking her back and I'm like, oh my God, I think, I think this may be us. And then all of a sudden our logo popped on the screen and it was like my husband and I like went numb and we were just like, oh my gosh, instantly bawling, go up to the stage. I can't, I'm shaking so bad trying to do my speech that I wrote like 30 minutes before the awards dinner. Cause I was like, it's not going to be us, but maybe we should just write something down to be safe. Um, can't even control, like my legs are shaking I'm shaking. And I, I, and, and then this last year of like the whirlwind that has come with it, it's just, been, it's such an amazing honor to be recognized as the dealer of the year. Cause there's so much sacrifice and blood, sweat and tears that went into an award like this and making sure that, you know, we're paying attention to the matrix on the scorecard that helps you even win the award. And that in tune just even helped our business because it was like, are we selling indoor air quality products? Are we making sure that the customer is connected through thermostats? So it's like, it's kind of a roadmap. If you follow these things, it's instantly going to show success in your business because you're kind of leveling yourselves up to to score your, score a certain number on a scorecard. Well, it, it equates to how, 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 how big are your ticket items? How big is this? And 
Um, it, it was just this moment of like, oh my gosh, we won and we get to call ourselves the dealer, the 2023 dealer of the year. And there's, it's one dealer out of 3,600 that win this award. So it is, it's massive. And it was, I can't even, it's, it's like the, the movie Inside Out, um, where, you know, like you get your core memories. I, this is my core memory. It's my, it's my, I have like a Bryant Island where like it pops up and we're like the Bryant dealer of the year. And so it's just one of those things that are going to stay with us forever. Um, and, you know, with winning a big award like this, you have two camps. You have the camps of people who don't know you, but hear your story and they are like, oh my God, this is amazing. And they level themselves up. They rate, It helps them raise their bar. They use it as motivation because they want to succeed. They want to see themselves through your success. And then you have the other camp, unfortunately, of people who were pretty negative about the win because they were bitter that they didn't, you know, they, people even use the word bitter that they didn't win yeah. or, um, you know, they didn't think that we were deserving of them. They were deserving of it. And it was, it, it was surprising to me, which I guess I should have expected with when I, when I thought of, oh, we're going to go, we have a chance. Cause I kept saying, well, we have a chance. We're, we're one of 18 companies that won Medal of Excellence and we're nominated. There is a chance it could be us. And so in, in my mental preparation for this, the dealer rally and, and the dealer of the year being announced, I never really prepared for the backlash from what we were going to ever get from, from dealers. Um, and I think that was the hardest thing. It kind of like spiraled me a little bit after it. Cause it was like, wow, these are people who, especially the people that were closest to us that I thought would really cheerlead and be happy for us kind of took mm -hmm. our win and made it about themselves instead. Um, and it really kind of shows you, it showed me who to put my time and attention on. I can't, I can't pay attention to the camp that is going to take my win and make it a negative thing. I'm going to pay attention to the camp that took, that is congratulating us and truly happy for us for our win and focus on, on my energy on that, because this is, this is, th th that camp's a lost cause. Like the, the negativity camp is, it's not doing me any good. I'm going to focus on being positive and being the best representation for Bryant and this award a a as we can. And I feel like yeah, it, we're getting to the tail end of it. Um, they, they announce a new dealer of the year in May. So we're really trying to, to just keep riding that, that wave until the new, the new winner is announced, but it's, it's a major accomplishment for our, our company. And we are like humbly proud that it, that we were the ones that won it. And it's, it's been an, it's been an awesome year. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations, because what a cool story. And even though they are going to draw a new one in May or there will be a new one announced, you'll always be the winner of the 2023 award. Yeah. And that is something that you can keep with you forever, forever yeah. and forever. And I think you should continue to promote that. It's oh, like yeah. people I mean, say, it's on our it's on all of our clothes, like <laughs> our uniforms. We've got it on our vans. Like I it's, it's yeah. It's a badge of honor that not many companies get to. It's a bra It's yeah. definitely a flex and a brag, and and I don't even care because yes. it. It's you have to brag about it. It's a major, a major accomplishment with within Bryant dealers, um, and so it, to 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 also be from where we were, you know, in 2019 when we attended our first Bryant, like I attended the first Bryant Women in HVAC conference to then 2023 winning the Bryant dealer of the year. It's just, it's been kind of like such a fun, just a fun story of where we started. I mean, when my husband and I first started the company, we had our first year, we've made a hundred thousand dollars and we were like, oh my God, we've done it. We're, we're it. We, we're successful. <laughs> like we, we, mm -hmm. we made money. And then now last year we were $3 million and it's like to see where we came from and to watch where we are now, it's just, it's a beautiful to me it, and it, it's my story. So obviously I find, I find it beautiful, but it is a beautiful story of just watching you build literally something from nothing to sitting around our table with our techs and being able to be like, guys, like we have 11 employees in our company. We, I, 
I, I don't even think that my husband and I even thought that that would be possible. Who would want to work for a small company that, you know, works out of their house and all this stuff. And we, we, every obstacle we faced in the last 14 years, we've just, we've, we've brushed, like just ran through it. And now it's like, okay, well, what's, what's on the horizon for 2024? Let's go. Um, we just never stopped where our foot is always on the gas and we're always trying to improve ourselves, our, our techs, our company. Um, we just don't ever want to get stagnant again. Like we were in the past where we were just, we just got comfortable and was like, Oh, this is it. Like we, we, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know where our end game is like, Oh, we want to have this many techs or this many trucks. We, we don't really have that. We just want to offer the best service possible. We want to, continue to help customers. We want to grow this amazing team and 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 show our employees that you can work for a company like us and love coming to work and have a, a you know a, a work life balance. You don't have to be miserable where you work and you know it just it it starts with Chris and I being that example to the rule and then you know showing it to to everybody else that like this is it's just something very very magical that we have built here and I and I and I love our team and I love all of our techs and this is like my fourth child <laughs> the weather changer is is yeah. kid number four to me and it, there's just so much pride that that I have for every single person that works with us and for us even our supply house like it's just we can't do this without all those people and we make sure that everybody who is in our corner and supports us they know how important that they are to us because without them we are not the weather changers yeah that's beautiful i hope you will play that for your team oh i I'm must send this video <laughs> <laughs> because they it, when people feel valued people show up yeah. people become the owners of their business owners of their route owners become owners in the company that has always been my biggest thing like i am developing a team of owners and if that's something that you don't want to be right from the get-go in the interview that is something that we ask people like we want a team of owners there is no bigger compliment in the world than when people call the office and say to my office staff or to my field techs you know a lot about this you must be the owner that's when i know that i have done my job is Great. that they represent the business so well and they are so bought into what is going on with this company and have been so educated and trained that they are people perceived as the owner. Yeah. And it what like so cool. And so many people in the home industry, like we talked about earlier in the podcast, are like, can't give them all my secrets. What if they go somewhere else? And I heard this before, I can't remember where I was at, but somebody had said, you know, this, this is like the stigma in the service industries and, and it's in other industries too, but it's like, can't give them, can't tell them everything, can't train them a hundred percent because what if they go somewhere else? And that person said, you know what? I understand that mentality and it's tough to trust, but imagine if they stayed mm -hmm. and you yeah. didn't, and yeah. now you've got this that you have to deal with every single day. It's worth the risk to yeah. invest in these people and make them feel important. The number one thing I always ask people in interviews is what is most important to you in a leader at a business? Because I hate being called the boss. I hate it. I am part of this team. I am working alongside of you. What is important with you with someone that is in leadership at a team? And many of my field technicians that come in more often than not will say, don't yell at me. And it makes me seriously emotional when they say it. Like, I always have to be like, okay, pull it together, Tanya. Because yeah. it's so sad that that's the industry that they're coming from. And when I, whenever someone says that to me, I'm like, they're not going to believe what I'm about to tell them this business is about because it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. But what I will do is make good on what I do tell them. And then they're like, some people, it's too much for them. Like I care too much and I have such a high bar and standard of excellence. That's too much for them. And that's fine. They're not the person for the team and you can't take it personally whatsoever. You think yeah. I put so much blood, sweat and tears into them. Oh my God, how could you possibly leave? It's not a personal thing for you. They're not ready for that yet. And that's okay. But those people that are and are craving a workplace like that, you can build a fucking awesome company 
by doing that and standing by your word and telling them that you're going to work alongside them instead of the point and, and yell like they're used to. So, yeah. oh my gosh, this has been such a good conversation. I yeah, it's been so much in fun. industry that is in the trades industry. I'm going to promote the hell out of this because this has been such a good conversation of a lot of things, which I knew it would be when we first started talking about doing this. <laughs> um, that, that can take this information that we've talked about and really apply it. This has been a training in itself of things <laughs> that you can do to have a really badass business. And so you so much, Samantha, are a just a pillar of what it looks like to be a woman in the trades industry that cares about the employees, that puts that extra little touch into training and wanting to know who their family is and making them feel important and look at the business that you've built yeah, from 150 to over 3 million. Like, I just want you to sit with that for a minute too and be really, really proud of what you guys have built. Like the amount of small businesses that make over a million dollars is like a dot. It's like yeah. the the speck in that Dr. Seuss movie. Where they're like, they're in the speck, you know? Yeah. You're part of that speck. Yeah. And it's so cool that you've continued to keep going. And it hasn't come without obstacles and getting your ass beat sometimes and getting back up and getting your butt kicked again and getting back up. But what a beautiful example of what is possible. And thank you for being vulnerable enough to talk about numbers and talk about the things that you struggle with, because what this podcast is designed to do is not to serve someone that is a hater that says, mm, oh, well, that wouldn't work for me. And that doesn't do that. Great. There's people out there. You're not ready for this information. But there are ladies out there that are like us that are in this industry that will listen to this podcast and they're going to say, holy shit, that is possible. I yeah. could become that Bryant company of the year. I can have a million dollar business as a woman in a very male dominated industry. So thank you so much for your time today and doing all of that stuff. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. This is, I've, uh, I, I've done one other podcast and this is, this is, it's just, it's such a fun way to, you know, bring awareness, especially awareness for women in the trades. And then um, just talking about like, I love the HVAC trade. I could, I could geek out about it all the time. So it's, it's just a, it's a fun thing to talk about and, you know, getting more people interested in the trades um, is, you know, something I'm very passionate about as well. Cause it's, 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 you need it. We're always going to be it. You're always going to need heating and air. So um, it's just, it's a very cool industry to be in and to have started a company and, and watched it grow and, and develop it. So yeah, thank you so much Absolutely. for having me on. Yes, absolutely. If someone wants to follow along with you on social media or find your company, if they're in the Denver market, or if they just want to connect with you because you're a badass and people want to connect with you, where can they find you at online? So our company, we're just on Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. It's just, it's, it's the handles, the weather changers. Um, and then I have, I kind of created an Instagram page that is just kind of focused only on heating, like the running a heating and air conditioning company. Um, and it's HVAC underscore Sam um, on Instagram. So I just get, you know, kind of post like fun stuff with the team and like, you know, stuff that we do. It's starting to kind of post a little bit more so people can see what it's like to be, uh, see the operation uh, side of the company that like then like flows into the, to the field. So um, yeah, if you, if you listen and have questions or whatever, like I, you could send me a, like a message and I, I, I'd love to talk to people about how I can help them discover like their potential and, and help their business. It's just, it's a really fun, it's, it, it's, it's a fun way that I get to, to connect with people. And I, and I absolutely love it. I love it. I love it. So at the end, Samantha, if you listen to the podcast, you know that I always ask everybody this question because I am building a book of badass ladies that are working in the trades industries. And I love to understand and I have become obsessed with how women and working mothers in the trades define what success looks for them. And what I mean by that is there are so many different ways that we can define success. For some people, it's slowing down. For some people, it's winning this award. For some people, it's having a certain amount of money and being unapologetic about that. For some people, it's time freedom. So Samantha, when you hear the phrase ladies kicking ass, what does that mean to you? 
Um, for me, it's, it's knowing, I, I think it's, it's power and knowing who you are. I'd be in your, your complete authentic self, you know, knowing where you are, knowing where you're going, knowing what your goals are and, and like having a team even to like help you do that. We have so much power and even just our voice and, and the people that we have around us. Um, so, you know, to me, every time I hear like, I love this question when you, when you're, when you're doing your podcast, cause it's always, it's always so different. But for me, it's, it's again, it's knowing my strength and what I bring to the table and bringing people around me that can help raise me up and I can help raise them up. And it's, you know, where's our, where people always say it's like, yes. And so like, yes. And what's next. Um, so that that's what sparks for me when you ask that question. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you so much for this. This has been so impactful. I've learned so much. I got like a stack of post-it note notes over here (laughs) that I've been taking off of this as well. I know this is going to be so beneficial for so many people. So thank you so much, Samantha. I appreciate you. you. I I appreciate you having me on. This has been an absolute blast.